This week's episode is sponsored by White's Beaconsfield. White's Beaconsfield is the number one company in the UK to brighten up your smile at a very affordable price. Get your perfect smile today using code AGJAMESENGLISH at checkout for a 15% discount on all products. from White's Beckinsfield. I'm on day five out of seven and my teeth are looking white. So it doesn't contain peroxide, so it's very, very safe for you to use on your teeth. It doesn't cause any sensitivity and I've literally got the most sensitive teeth. The most affordable product, works like a dream. Look how white, with no filter, no sensitivity, and it is just one of the best that I've ever used. Right, that's three days, it's crazy. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Yeah, I was groomed, heavily groomed. Um, and given alcohol from like eight years old, I was given my first line of coke. Actually, I told people in the press at the 14, I'd taken coke in a club situation. I wasn't, I was given drugs a lot younger. And, and other sorts of drugs as well to suppress me um, whilst these things were happening to us. I've been nine months of telling me daddy had six strokes, many strokes. He's got really bad dementia now. And he sort of blamed himself because I never told him. But I was told not to say. He, the BBC saved my life, if I'm honest. Saved my life because I probably would have gone down a path of if I hadn't got into that show, I probably would have gone down a path of trying to stay in this industry, working in it, 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 it probably would have ended up an addict and on, in, in, in the sex industry or something like that, I know I would. Another thing that happened to me about being taken out of my house, held in an apartment, a, a place around the corner from here actually for three days, and being continuously raped by three guys for somebody else's death that didn't happen to be home at the time when they knocked. I travelled the world, Sis and I were just everywhere we went, 30 million people watched us get married, we grew up in front of the nation. I passed out once at the top of the stairs in the Vic and hit the deck because I was just constantly would have that thing with coke where I was doing that much and then I would gouge like that out with stuff where I needed to have a line where I'd be up for days and I would gouge out really bad. Um, almost like heroin addict gouges out. I used to be like that bad with drugs. And I was pregnant with Jodie. I was three months pregnant with Jodie. And I was freaking ill and then all my organs were giving up. And they said to me I had about six weeks to live. I didn't give a shit. They ended up shackling me to the streets to the seat halfway to LA. Because I was in first class, I was abusing him on the phone with the credit card machine, I bought everything from duty free, and I went in the toilet and I had a cigarette, everyone's laying in their beds to sleep in first, paid a fortune. And the stewardess is knocking on there, Miss Westbrook, are you smoking in there? And I opened the door of a cigarette, I went, yeah, what are you gonna do? Open the door and fucking throw me out the plane. You're not. But kids go, do you know what, mum? And when you split up with dad and you did your stubborn shit and end up in a hostel and everything, she went and you was running an extension lead under the door to nick the electric out of the hallway. And we were sharing pot noodles and shit because we had nothing, because I was a raging freaking cokehead, selfish as it is. She said, we used to lay in bed, the three of us, freedom with our dog. She said, burping, the, she nice to burp the alphabet and make Kyla. <laughs> and it was them things they remember. She said, but you go for all the times when we've had freaking 10 grand birthday parties and stuff. She went, I can't remember half of them things. Boom, we're on. There you go. Today's guest, we've got Daniela Westbrook. How are you? I'm a little bit shy, if I'm honest. Yeah, that's, I don't believe that. <laughs> I am. Honestly, I've been, I've been so excited to come on and, you know, 
but I've been so nervous as well, yeah. if I'm honest, because I don't know, I haven't done anything for a year. I haven't spoken to anyone for a year. And the reason I wanted to come on your show is, A, because you've got a great reputation. There's so many people are telling me, oh, I can't believe you're going on his show and it's going to be great for you and no pressure. Um, and the other thing is because you don't come from a journalistic background and, you, and you've walked your own line. So for me, it's, it, was a, it was a no-brainer. Yeah, I appreciate that. And first of all, for coming on the show, it's very much appreciated. You've got a great story, I believe. I think you can have a story where people can look at inspiration because as much as people can read the press and watch the news, they can fuck you over a hundred times over, but people need to understand the background you've came from, from being gang raped, abused, and these are trigger points why addiction starts. But first of all, you're clean, you're sober now, so congratulations. Yeah, I'm doing all right today. Yeah, so listen, I believe we're all struggling. As human beings, we're all struggling. And I always try and bring people on the podcast where people can find some light, some motivation, some inspiration. I don't give a fuck how dark your past is, what age you are, what colour of skin you are. Everybody's got a story, and I believe your story's there to be told. You've been on a lot of programmes, but it's only like five minutes, ten minute snippets. I want to get right into a better understanding of who you are, what triggers you, and how well you're doing now? I might cry. Um, That's okay. I'm, I'm always crying anyway. But I always go back to the start with my guests. Where they grew up and how it all began. Yeah. Well, I grew up in Woodford Green in Essex. Um, just a normal, like, mum and dad. Um, me nan's side of the family come from a traveller background. And, like, uh, my dad's just... Granddad's Scottish, funny enough. Good man. Um, yeah, yeah. And the Westbrooks. And, um... Yeah, it's just normal. My mum, my mum's um, a single child, not an only child from her family, was adopted at an early age and stuff. She worked in London as a Playboy bunny, you know, and and, and that. And my dad was a carpet fitter, just an, a normal, a normal, normal, whatever's a normal family. Um, he had a child from his first marriage, an older brother, that step brother I've got, don't really see. Um, and I was eight years the only child really, until my younger brother come along, and. Um, I was always like the blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl. Out of all my cousins, I was the one that was trouble, that was starting fights with people and stuff, the little fat one. Um, and I was just, you know, confident. I was that kid. My mum worked nights up in London for the Playboy Casino and stuff and uh, and the Valbon. And my dad used to finish work, pick me up for me nan, so I was always with my dad. And um, I was the apple of my dad's eye. I still am today, God bless him, and her. Uh, and that was it, really. And my mum worked with a lot of um, famous people coming to the club, obviously, at that time in the 70s, like The Who and The Stones and all those sort of people. And and um, I think someone wanted someone for a video shoot, a child for a video shoot. And obviously, she was proud of her daughter. She pushed me forward. It's always what she really wanted to do. Um, and didn't see the harm and the dangers in it at the time. And my dad went, no, she's not doing that. Because I used to ride horses and I was just a normal kid. And... Um, she pushed and pushed and pushed and she just did it anyway. Put me up at Sylvia Young Theatre School and when I was seven. Um, and I didn't know any different, I was seven. Do you know what I mean? I just was into Barbies and stuff and horses. Went and did that and um, I was not a natural performer. I was naturally confident but not a natural performer. Like I weren't really good at dancing, I was a bit dumpy and a little bit out of it and I couldn't really sing. But then eventually by the time I got to 15, I was still not great but I could worked me way around a few things. And I went there from seven years old and I went full time at 11. But yeah, I worked a lot. I worked an awful lot from day one, bang, I worked a lot. I worked with Queen and, you know, Freddie Mercury and uh, George Michael. I've worked with so many different types of people. I did the West End for Angela Lloyd Webber. I've done role varieties. I've worked at the Buckingham Palace Garden parties. I've done everything. Um, and I was just a normal kid, you know, and I was the only child. And all of, as, as in every child, you just want to do, please people, please your parents and stuff. But with, with becoming more famous, um, not famous as such, but I did commercials. I was on TV all the time. And I went to a little local primary school and other kids didn't really like it. So I was on a Colgate commercial, I was doing different things. I was in Grange Hill, I was busy. And I got bullied and I got bullied and I got bullied and I got bullied and I got beaten up all the time. I had all my hair cut off, I cut off one of my plaits at school and it was horrific for me. Um, and then my dad agreed to let my mum send me to full-time school at Sylvia Young's. And I think that's really just where I wanted to be because I was like all the other kids. But what I hadn't spoken about to both my parents was I was being abused massively within the industry. Um, 
Du har ikke haft selv? Nå, så okay, man. Tårt. Um, um, yeah, and it was a hard, because at seven years old, you don't really want to say to your mum and dad, like, I never even seen my parents naked, thank you for that. To suddenly say that I'm being made to do this, 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 and this, thanks. <laughs> Is that bad? I got a big towel. Um, to say, as my makeup sponge there, <laughs> um, I'm being abused. And it, and it was hard. So it took me till I was nine years old to finally tell somebody in a position of what I would call power. And I won't say who the people were that I told. And I was told to be quiet and go to work. And I think when you get to nine and you're still a kid, like you haven't even reached puberty and you've got people that have abused you day in, like not day in, day out, but like month in, month out on jobs and, and cabaret circuits and stuff. And the other kids around you are having the same. Um, it's difficult, it's really difficult. And when you're told to just be quiet and go to work, you want to please people. Because you don't want to, you make you look a liar. Yeah. And I think, you know, those sort of people that do that to you, know that. Manipulate and as a you. kid, you don't know yeah, that you're uh, you just said to shut yeah. up. Yeah, I was groomed, mm -hmm. heavily groomed. Um, and given alcohol from like eight years old, I was given my first line of coke. Actually, I told people in the press at the 14, I'd taken coke in a club situation. I wasn't, I was given drugs a lot younger. And, and other sorts of drugs as well to suppress me um, whilst these things were happening to us. Um, and I think when I went to Sylvia Young's, it was normal for me to go there because I've been around a lot of kids that I've worked with that it happened to. And God rest, Sylvia would go mad if she'd known that it had happened to us because she'd done everything to protect us, you know? But yeah. we were told by people not to say. And it was just very difficult. And then I knew, I knew no different. So at nine years old, when you say that, like, you learn real faster on your own in this world. Mm -hmm. People can make their assumptions, people can have their opinion, but people need to understand how young you were when you started getting abused and groomed for seven years old, for getting drugs at nine years old. People and I was given drugs regularly yeah, as well. And in, in this industry, and people are groomers and it goes on, I think a lot more people are speaking out. And with you telling your story now, a lot more people will come forward and have some strength as well. So that takes courage. That shows you that you are a fighter. That shows that how far you've came in life. Everything that you've went through to where you are today, it's, you're still fighting. You're still kicking on. You're still pushing forward. And that takes courage and strength. I think it, it, yeah, I think it does. But it takes it takes a lot of help as well from people and a help and a, and um. It takes to get to learn the word no is a powerful word, and it wasn't a word I ever knew to say. No, I don't want to do something, or no, you can't do that to me, or no, I won't. Because I just wanted to please people. Yeah. So yes, 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 yes. And then, you know, obviously, so when I got to like, I don't know, whatever age, 16, 17, 18, or 15, 16, so whatever, and my friends are getting their first boyfriend and nights out and, you know, and they're, and they're having sex for the first time and it's all exciting and they're falling in love. I felt nothing. When it come down to it about having a first sexual encounter, I felt nothing. Because I just, in my head, I departmentalised sex or somebody touching me with... I don't know, with abuse. Did you just and shut work. off then? I just shut off, just I didn't empty. feel anything. Yeah. I felt nothing about it. Because mm -hmm. that's how I dealt with it as a child, because they'd numb me so much with different kinds of concoctions and, and stuff like that. So when someone first offered me a line of cocaine at 14, there was an older boy that I really liked, who still to this day goes, I feel so bad about it. I would like, you're still a mate of mine. I'm like, listen, man, you weren't really the first person. It doesn't matter, but... You know, and he said, he's like, I feel terrible, I carried it for years. I said, well, it's not your fault, I've done it anyway. And because it was something I recognised, that I knew hadn't killed me, mm -hmm. I did it. And it was, you know, it was the 80s, you know, and it was the thing to do. Then it was the yuppie scene, everyone was champagne and cocaine, and obviously it went to EastEnders, and all of my friends were normal. They were going to college, and, you know, I'm ringing up my best mate on a Thursday night from primary school, and going come out tonight, I'm going to a party and George Michael's going. And she was like, I can't, I've got to go to college in the morning, I've just got my bus pass, I really ain't got the money. I'm like, I'll pick you up. She's like, I can't. You know, she's still my best friend today. Ginny, I'd be lost without her, but she was like, Dan, I didn't know what to do. I just saw you go, you were flying with one thing, but you healed so many secrets back. And I got to a point a few years ago, just before I went into Big Brother, and I thought, you know what, I'm not going to be the keeper of secrets no more. I'm an adult, I don't have to be. You know, I got clean for 14 years in recovery after nearly dying. And all my organs shutting down. And I was like, I did a 14-year recovery and I didn't show up. You know, yeah, I was clean and sober. I didn't pick up, but that's all I didn't do was pick up. 
I sat in meetings I never shared. I didn't work a programme, I didn't have a sponsor, I didn't I just looked good and I didn't show up and I did that because my husband was a multi millionaire and it I could look good. Yeah. Were you scared to open up because you knew it could have brought back all the emotions for being seven and eight years old? No, I was still that mindset of like out of sight, out of mind, it didn't happen to me. I didn't deal with any of it. Walk it out. Didn't deal with any of it. I hadn't actually found a therapist either at that time that I couldn't A manipulate <laughs> and B that wasn't, you know, a clock watcher that could understand. So, and then I went recently, went to treatment uh, just over a year ago up in Luton. I met a fantastic therapist, Michelle, and she just stripped me. And she, every which way I, I, I tried to wiggle out of it, even sometimes about realising, she just went bang, bang, bang. She walked my path. So she, and I still speak to her weekly now. She's like, she just got me. I was very, I've been blessed in the situations I've been put in. I've been blessed in the positions I've been put in. There's a lot of kids I went to school with at Sylvie's that are no longer here that are taking their lives. You know, because of what they've been through and, and, and what happened to them. Was there other kids at your age getting abused then, back then? Loads of us, yeah, loads of us. Have you ever all spoken with each other? Is it kind of all you know what, I'm still very good friends with a lot of people that I, like, um, I grew up with and worked with. Through the power, I hate social media, really, funny enough. Um, but uh, only because I'm too accessible to people and I lose my temper with them. My son says I have no filter with it. But thanks to that, I've got, managed to contact over the years a lot of people and there's been times when I've been at my lowest that then people have picked me up because they've walked my path mm -hmm. alright they didn't become famous they didn't get the break I got but they still know what we went through and we shared something back then and how they've dealt with it and moved on as a with their lives and gone on to have children and families and yeah. you know was there no sort of psychologists or anything back in the day for such a young age to get in all that limelight from all your adverts all your TV work was anybody no, ever no, no 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 we were groomed and that was yeah. like reward the job the did work your dad or anything see any signs I told my dad when I was, um, it's going to all upset me now. I didn't tell my dad about it until I wrote my second book. Because I was sat with a friend of mine who used to work for Mix Mag Matt, and he was writing my book for me. And um, I said to him, do you know what, I'm going to tell you something now. And I don't know where it's come from. It's like something's just come on me. And I said, you need to speak about this. And I spoke about it openly, and I spoke about um, another thing that happened to me about being taken out of my house, held in an apartment, a, a place around the corner from here, actually, for three days and being continuously raped by three guys for somebody else's debt. It didn't happen to be home at the time when they knocked. Um, and I spoke all about that in my book, and uh, my poor friend Matt just sat there, ah. <laughs> he didn't know what to say, and he's like, okay, so I said, listen, before I do this, before we finalise the book and put it in, I need to sit down and have a conversation with my dad. Do you know what I mean? I've never seen my dad stop drinking at 19, because my granddad, bad alky. Um, and quite violent so my dad had never seen that and I put him through a lot of shit with my addiction over the years publicly that he didn't understand because he never knew any of this um, and I told my dad and then within telling my dad within yes a second within nine months of telling my dad he had six strokes many strokes he's got really bad dementia now And he sort of blamed himself because I never told him. But I was told not to say. Yeah, you were groomed, man. It's, 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 you've been through so much your life. You've been through the wars. You've been to hell, not just one, but many occasions. But first of all, I keep coming back to it. You show courage and strength. And you're not the only one who's I'm not at been all. through that. There's so many people who I've spoke to. And, and when they start speaking about it, the people who they help, even you speaking about this, you're going to help so many people. And it gives people a better understanding why you went down some of the routes you went down to block out the pain, the misery, blaming yourself, thinking it was okay. Should have just says no. It's not as easy as that when you're getting groomed, when you're getting manipulated and abused by fucking dirty old men. So Yeah, and not just men either, women as well. It's not just men, yeah. it, you know, it's women as well, and it's just it's it's just a frightening mm -hmm. And that never really leaves you, but it just, you just learn to get on with it. And I think, I've got extended, so I'm so elated with stuff. And it, the BBC saved my life, if I'm honest. Saved my life, because I probably would have gone down a path of... If I hadn't got into that show, I probably would have gone down a path of trying to stay in this industry, working in it, within, probably would have ended up an addict in, 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 in the sex industry or something like that. I know I would, because sex meant nothing to me, and I would have ended up that way. That's why... I, you know, I joined the OnlyFans site as well because I wanted to re I wanted to make my own site because I'm trying. I want to make. If girls are going to work in that game, I wanted to try and make it a safer place. It's not all about being groomed. And so, so I joined that, and I've learned so much from that as well. It's like I don't know. I don't know where to start with it, but I know my purpose is bigger than just being an actor.
Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and a lot of people sit online and go to me, and that's why sometimes I have to hand my social media over because I get so angry because I've got children as well. And I'm like, they're like, well, why did you never report him? Why have you been raped and never reported it? Why have you... Because why would I? Because when you're a kid and you've been told that at nine years old, something in the back of my mind, as stupid as it is, says, well, no one's going to believe you anyway. Yeah, but don't even reply to those fucking idiots, man. These are, these are just mugs. These, these That's don't why I have dust. my social you know media. I mean? It's difficult it's because I do respond sometimes as well where I go, well, fuck it. But in life... And sometimes, it, and yeah, sometimes I do does, get a kick out of it. Beings, I have to say, it's yeah. I do get a kick sometimes out of just opening up the door yeah. and then letting all my followers give it to them. But I think as human that. beings, <laughs> we are all sensitive. We are all vulnerable and... Yeah. If we were to go on their page and say the exact same shit, they'd be crumble. Oh, so God, it would be, yeah. This is just part just of it. Life, life's a funny thing. Nobody knows what the fuck we're doing. We're all winging it. I don't know what yeah. the fuck I'm doing. I know what I'm doing, but I question it. Same as yourself, everything you went through, we question it. What is our purpose? Why are we here? Nobody fucking knows. That is where exactly I think all that, people yeah. are so confused and go through addictions or... Lots of things. Yeah. It's lots of things, you know. Some people have eating disorders. Some people have got manic depression and, and no two people are the same so no two addictions are mm-hmm. the same and no two using are the same but it's all relevant in that person's life yeah. and not to judge everybody else's yeah. on, on how great our using was like I've sat in I've sat in, in meetings and heard people go you know and I drink a bottle of wine a night da, 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 and I've seen people snigger and I think hang on a fucking minute that's a massive thing to that person how mm. dare you laugh at that person's like they're like basically saying do you know what that's not an addiction get out there and use some more come back and use who the fuck are you to say that that's, if that one bottle of wine is ruining that person's life and they're in the right place then fucking fair yeah. play it's the same people who troll who are the same people who post about mental health Yeah, they're all over the place and that is always and they've got mental yeah. health anyway that's, that's a clear. reflection of them that's just a reflection of them yeah we're, at least we're out here trying we're out here trying to make the world a better place I mean, trying I'm, to make ourselves a better place yeah. that is hard especially if you've been in the limelight for the There's last 30 odd years people a lot worse going on you yeah know? People out there losing their children to, to, to you know, cancer and leukaemia and, yeah. you know, and things like that. That's, that's traumatic. Mm-hmm. To me, that's true. Tra- as a parent, that's traumatic. And, you know, I do feel for my kids. And when I went on Big Brother, as much as, you know, my kids were like, oh, God, so how is she going to be? Because I went in there doing 11 grams of gear a day. I ain't going to lie. No one knows that. I was doing 11 bags of gear a day. And then they walked me through that fucking door and I went, Phew. and my son and everyone just went, oh, God, the calm down, the fallout. And I just picked up and went to work. Because it's here. And I did it to say, do you know what? This is me, this is who I am. And uh, that's where I was at. I'm not going to lie about it. That's what I was doing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I came out of there and, and my son went, I'm so proud of you. I hadn't seen him for four months. And he came downstairs and the friends and family thing, and I just fell apart. It's great to see him. And uh, my son's my best friend in the world. I don't do anything about asking my son. Like, like with advice, work wise, and he's an intelligent kid. I'm proud of him. You know, I haven't given him an easy life, or my daughter, but an easy life. But, you know, we all protect my daughter a bit more because my son's older. So she's more, she's our princess. But, um, yeah, my son's been there for me when everyone else, every single door's closed, that kid's been there. Yeah, that's the only thing when you're in the limelight. It doesn't just affect you, it affects everyone that's around you. Oh, God, Again, yeah. it grows, it grows in our strength. It grows and you become immune to it. Well, but again, you don't but really you don't. become immune. Do you know what yeah, I mean? My yeah, brother's old yeah. Bill, my brother's a copper. Yeah. You couldn't get two more different kids out of yeah. the same freaking gene pool. Like, he's doing really well and he's old Bill, and I'm like, I'm so proud of my brother. But at the same time, he's got a sister like me, and it's like, oh, it's difficult with the life I've had. And he does laugh at me. He goes, oh, for God's sake, what has she done now? You know? And, and he just says, You're my sister, I love you. Unconditionally, you dealt a bad hand. I didn't get, thank goodness, I, what hap- happened to me never happened to my brother. Mm-hmm. You know what yeah. I mean? So he sees it for what it is, and we're both all grown adults now. My kids see, you know, they understand. But also, you've got to come to a point in your life where you think, I can't keep living there. The past. Yeah, I can't keep living there, and that trauma, it's not happening to me today. And thank God that we have got stuff being put in place for sex trafficking of children and people in general, and it is being made aware of, and people are know, and do know the signs and, you know, of what's going on in this world. Yeah. You know, it's no different to kids being sent out to do fucking, I don't know, jobs that they shouldn't be doing at a young age in different countries. It's like, that's all trapped, like, using is child labour. Yeah. What I was doing was child labour just in a sex trade. Mm-hmm. And it's wrong. And I don't think any amount of money that I've earned in the world or, you know, uh, and, and blessings that I've been given with television is ever going to take that pain away. But it's given me a platform to be able to speak up about it at a time when it is current Yeah. as well. 
see when you turned like 16, see when you get into EastEnders, you got all the fame, all the attention, because EastEnders was at its peak then, you're talking 15. We only had three channels on the yeah, telly, weren't you know. You're talking 15 million, 20 million people watching. Was that, did you think the more success you'd become, the more you would forget about your pain? Um, I just thought it was going to stop now because people can't do it to me because now I'm a famous one. But I just knew that I was a famous person that wasn't going to be led into their circle to behave the way they did. Um, and I think also that for me is a, it's quite a, now, looking back at it now, 30 years on, and with what's come to light in the press about all these paedophiles all over America, England, everywhere, what goes on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually probably one of the dangerous people that they could have abused because I've got a big mouth. Yeah, you've got the guts to speak out. And I have, yeah, but, um, you know, I'm not a person. I've written two books, both been bestsellers. I've never named and shamed anybody I've dated, been out with, and I'm the same about my abuse. I would never name and sh shame. I've got every right to, but where's that going to get me? You know, and where's that going to get my children? Where's that going to get their children or their grandchildren? It's not. The people that are in the right positions know who. I've, I've given my statement. The people that are in position of power now that are doing something about it have got it, and that's enough for me. But I would, I've, I've signed a thing to say I want to keep my that personal. Were you ever threatened or anything to keep your mouth shut? I've had a lot of that stuff done to me. I've been taken out of my house. Yeah, when I was with Brian Harvey, I got taken out of my house. And he came home and he never saw me again. It was a very, very tough time. Mm -hmm. Very tough time. And he's made Brian really ill. And luckily, Brian was never abused. But there was a price on his head. And I was getting married to him. And the people that had the price on his head, to be, they wanted him in that circle. And um, they thought I'd tell him what I knew. So they took me out of the picture for a long while, put me somewhere yeah. that I shouldn't be. And... I'd sign my house and everything over to him. Yeah. Because I know Brian speaks out even now. To a lot and people about, call him crazy and yeah, he's Peter not. Bell. Yeah, yeah. He's really not. And I've got a lot of love in my heart for Brian, always will. And um, all he's trying to do is the right thing. And he that, gets threatened and abused by people. Do you think that's because of what he's seen with you? No, it's because he's, try, he's, he's trying to do the right thing and, and out these people that have hurt people close to us, myself included. And luckily they never got to Brian. So that, that's but he did lose his job and he's 17 because that's of it. That's what they do though, discredit you. Yeah, discredit and, it, and they've you. made Brian a prisoner in his own home and it's really sad because I know what Brian's doing is the right thing. People can call him crazy and say he's ranting and everything else, but I know what he's doing is the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I have to be careful what I say because I say to him, listen, Brian, I'll never work again. I have to go to work. But I'm also not a grass and anyone that knows me knows I'm not a lolly. I'm not. And I've dealt with my shit and I'm still lucky to be working. I am. And... um I understand what he's doing, but, you know, it's just sometimes it's such a dangerous game to be playing with. Yeah, people, And he's only trying to do what's right. Yeah, the people who are grooming, who are trafficking children, are the most powerful men in this country. Oh, yeah, they are. But In the world, actually. Yeah, the voice of the, but the voice of the people is a lot stronger if people unite. If people, it is and it's not, because people can go missing like this and they never come back. Yeah, it's really and true. And that's just the way well, it is. Yeah, we've uncovered a lot of stuff on here and we've made a documentary and stuff, but... And I'm a mother. Yeah. And I can't, do you know what I mean? So for me, it's like, and I still need to work. And do you know what? I love working. I love nothing more than playing Sam Mitchell. It's my favourite thing to do. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I, I never feel more at home than when I walk on that square. It's for me, it's like I'm alive. Especially when, when Barbara was there at the time. And, and that's a blessing. That was a blessing to me. Barbara being around, she'd been around this industry a long time. And, and, and I, I credit Barbara for me coming out the other side of a lot of things. Because she showed me how to, sorry to jump onto something else, but she showed me when I was in bad places with stuff. She said, to, she showed me how to be publicly facing and how to break down behind a closed door, which I never knew the two. Does she protect you? Barbara, um, Barbara's always protected me. Barbara protects everyone. <laughs> um, Barbara's a woman for me that can come through anything that life's thrown at her in life. You know, she went into theatre at a young age and hard for her from the east end of London and, you know, she struggled when she was little and she just, she's talented and she's a tough bird, you know what I mean? She's not frightened to have walked off. And, you know, I watched a programme about last night, a drama that they made about a life story and it was, it's interesting. And uh, she came back and she got to a point where she met Scott and she was like, she was doing one-woman shows around the country, you know, and she'd gone from being a big star from Sparrows Can't Sing, Carry Ons and, and then you just hit a point in your life where you don't work for 10 years. Trust me, I know, I've just done it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it was a similar age. And it's like, 
And even Stevie McFanny goes, God, don't it remind you sometimes that your life's just like Mira's mother's, because we do call them all. I said, what do you mean? He went, you know, gangster fellas. You know, he said, you know, that lifestyle, gangster fellas. You know, young, and then young toy boy blokes and I've been on your ass and da 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 da. And I went, listen, if that's what it, if that's what it mirrors, I'll be no, no one better to look up to than me. Yeah. It's all got to come good in the end. How did the Sam Mitchell character start? Yeah. How did that, how did you end up with the job in EastEnders? Well, I could see it as one of two ways. It could have been a payoff, it could have been a, a blessing. Um, I went for an audition, there was 1,500 people went up for Sam Mitchell for the BBC and Channel 4 had just been launched, it was brand new. And we was only on twice a week then. And I went for four auditions and my last one, I remember finishing my history GCC, putting my pen down, I was like, can I go? Very little when they only let me in for exams by name because I've been expelled because I was naughty. <laughs> um, and they went, yeah, go and I got the train up to Elf Street, did my last reading, they brought Sid into reading me, who plays Ricky. Um, and they had a picture of the boys next to two pictures, their headshots, Phil and Grant. And they put mine in the middle, and I had a big round face. All I was missing was a bald head, really. <laughs> and, um, you know, and that was me. And then I did that, and I read with Sid. And then I got home on the train. I'd been through the door about an hour. I lived in Loughton with my mum and dad. And the phone rang, and I remember we didn't... And we did have mobiles, but they were like that big. My dad had one. And my mum went, oh, Sylvia's on the phone. She wants to talk to you. And I went in my mum's bedroom, and I was on the phone. We lived up in Baldwin's Hill, right across the forest. I remember looking out, and she was like, you need to sit down a minute. And I'm married in mind, I've worked constantly from seven with amazing people but this was a big deal and uh she went yeah you got it I was like what she was like you got it you're doing it you start tomorrow at 10 I was like what she went they're biking your script now I was like okay she went nice one well done kids and Sylvie's always been fantastic for all of us you know um and I remember sitting down I just put the phone down I went ah I started screaming my mum fucking threw the thing up in the air in the kitchen everyone come flying upstairs well I'm doing it I've done it and everyone was just went mad and, and, and they were so pleased for me. And I went in the next day and I remember being so scared. The first scene was in the square sitting on a bench with Sid. And I just look at Ringer for me daughter does now. And it was like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And Sid looked at me and went, yeah, you'll do. That was the first thing he went, yeah, you'll do. That was it. And then we'd started the scene and that was it, the first scene. And, and I went, every time I go back, we've still got Dave Bowen, a lot of our cameramen, a lot of our people, they're all the same. And it's... It's a great place to work. I mean, you spend more time together than, especially now, four times a week, whatever the show's on. You spend more time than you do at home. Yeah. So I love EastEnders, mate. I loved it. But even though all the trauma and pain you've been through your life, you've got, you've still also got. I've had some great the times. Success. I've had a great life. And your mum and dad must have been so proud for you at sixteen to be on the biggest TV show yeah. in Britain. Yeah. I mean, they didn't know I was taking drugs. Yeah. I've been taking drugs for two years before that. They yeah. didn't even know. Bless them. I mean, my dad wouldn't know a line of coke jumped up and hit him in the face. But shut up, he's a fight. He said, no, he wouldn't know. You know what I mean? My mum would have known, but she hadn't done it. Um, but my dad wouldn't have a clue, you know what I mean? So, yeah. I, I, you know, I was so happy for me. So happy for me. Yeah. And in a way, it compensated for me inside that I could put to bed all that stuff. Were you taking gear on set? Towards the middle of my first time I left, yeah. When me and Sid got married in it, you could see it in us on thin. Then when they brought me back and we did stuff where I've been, well, I got caught in bed with David Wicks in Spain, Bianca's dad. Um, Ricky and Bianca caught me, then Phil and Grant caught me, they all walked in on me, was in bed with David Wicks. Um, I was ill then, really ill. Really, really freaking ill. Did nobody ever pull you aside and say, look, get your shit together? Loads of people did. Oh, did people Loads know? Loads of people did, everyone knew. Usually at the um, start, people don't really see. No, everyone knew, everyone knew. Was it every day then? Yeah, and Stevie and, and Ross were really against it. And that was well before Barbara came in the show. But hellfire when Bar came in, man, I was under fire. <laughs> she was on me, mate. She hates drugs. Does she? Oh, God, yeah. And she, and rightly so. Like, her and Junie Brown like, played dot. It's not their generation. Different things. Like, when in their day, people had a drink and a bar fight. I mean, so she just didn't get it and she couldn't see why I was killing myself, ruining my life. So when I got clean for 14 years, I'm... I was very close to Barbara. My husband and Scott were good friends. Scott's heavily into recovery, our other half. Many years, over 20 years, I think now, in recovery. And we used to do everything together, the four of us. Yeah. Outside of work, as well as with work. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I learnt a lot. How was the fame? That age, the, three, the first three years you were on EastEnders? Oh, fucking hell, I loved it. Did you? Yeah, the brand new guitar, <laughs> I was earning money. I was yeah. freaking, I mean, I was loving yeah. life. Do you know what I mean? I was, I was working with Dave Stewart from Arithmix, did a film for him in Cannes Film Festival. I, I travelled the world. Sid and I were just everywhere we went. 30 million people watched us get married. We grew up in front of the nation. 
So when it came out about my addiction, it, you know, back then with the press, and it was only four channels. We didn't have Sky, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have social media. You know, we just had red tops. Papers Did that make it worse when it came out in the paper? Did you get a heads up before it came out as well? Yeah, they have to let you know by six o'clock the night before they're running it because you have to be able to be given the right to reply. And this was, was this three years in? Oh, God, no. Uh, yeah, three or four years in, yeah, I think you're about right. I was that old, I can't remember. What were you thinking then? Were you thinking, okay, I'm going to stop, or did it make your addiction worse? Um, I shit myself, if I'm honest. Because I was so full of my own self-importance and my own ego by that time. You know, I thought I could walk on water. Untouchable. And, um, yeah, and plus, I, you know, I had a famous boyfriend, and was with, I'd been with, out of a footballer, and then I was with, with Brian for years, and I went out with Robbie Williams... I went back with Brian, went out of Robbie <laughs> to piss Brian off. You know it is. Yeah. So, no, and that's what my mates, local, you know, my friends were like, what the fuck? They didn't get any of it. Do mm-hmm. you know what I mean? But I still wanted to be like my mates. And you Did can't you have do two friends then? Or was it an, your own wee bubble? My best mate, Ginny, and, and, and cousin, and, and, and Leg, we call him Leg because he's so tall, Stuart, is my, like, my kids' like, point of call. Not their godparents, but just good eyes. We've all been in the same circle and they're still my friends today. And, it, and even up until two or three years ago, Ginny, it was Ginny and Kaz and Stu that got me together and put me in hospital, put me in a men- and had me sectioned. What age? Two years ago. Just previously? Yeah. When I had septic semen and stuff, and I walked, was, was ill. I was cutting myself, I cut all my own face here. Mm-hmm. Um, I cut this bit of my face there. I self started self-harming, terrible, burning myself with cigarettes and stuff. I was in a bad place, but, I've, you know... You've come out of it again. I come out of it again, but you know, I'm not, and today I'm not, it took me seven years into a 14 year recovery to turn around and go, do you know what, I'll never use again. And the minute my, my marriage broke down and, I, and everything fell apart, mate, I picked up that day. I wouldn't even know where to find it, but God did I find it. Because I'm an addict. I would find it anywhere. I'll find it anywhere yeah. I want. When I spent 14 years not having it anywhere near me, but I still knew seven years down the line, I don't know what the switch was with that seven years. I was still so fearful every day for seven years of using. Then I got comfortable and I had a lot of money around me. My husband was on premier, the premier equivalent. We sold to Addy Lee, sold for millions. You know what I mean? And, and, and he got clean and sober with me. He was a great, he was a great strength and ally to me. Yeah. Amazing man. Do you know what I mean? And I love him to bits and I wish him nothing but goodness. But you know, we just fell out of love and that shit happens. Yeah. That's life, man. It's a it roller coaster. Is, do you know what I mean? Like, I just recently got divorced after 19 years. We've been separated since 2015. And we just only got divorced like two weeks ago. It's cool. And everyone's like, oh, what did you get out of your divorce? I said nothing. We went on dot, dot, dot gov, dot uk, filled our forms out, put it back and forth, and we're split. It's done. And what did you get out of it? Nothing. I walked into that marriage with two carrier bags and my son. Just because he had millions. I never did a day's work in his company. I'm not entitled to take anything from him. Our children have grown up. What's he got to give me? Nothing. He gave me everything. He gave me my life. He put me in that many treatment centres. So for me, I, you know, why would I, I don't, don't marry someone to see what you can get when it don't work out. How did you meet? I met him at a boxing event. And Michael Wait. Greco took me to who plays Beppe. Were you still on it that time? Oh God, I was freaking terrible. <laughs> you know, lucky I even got there this right day. <laughs> was he on it as well at that time? Oh yeah. So both of you were on yeah. it, so that's how he's met. And man, this sounded, and then he had disposable income. And plus he that's owned the, the biggest thing if dispatch you're an car company and car yeah. company in the in the UK. Mm-hmm. So I mean, so we had black fleets of blacked out limos and it was all like crazy. Like I was like, wow, I thought I was in casino. Like ginger, I thought it was like ginger from casino, mm-hmm. you know. I was like, whoa. Yeah. And um, big bags of gear, yeah, man, I gear drive. I everything I wanted. And then the first time I met him, he was like, I'm oh, starting to get a semi bag. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I knew I'd give you one more bag. <laughs> hey, I told you that. All <laughs> <laughs> be scouts, mates went, Oh, you're gonna love him, Westy. He's really good looking. I was like, Okay, um, but yeah, like, I met him, and like, the first day I met him was at a meet at Langham's for something. It called, we sat, called some meeting or whatever. Um, about something. And he gave me my own car account and Steve McFadden knew who he was and Steve's like, don't be messing with him, you know, you're going to fucking think. I went, he'll be fine, don't worry, he's sweet, I've got him right where I need him. And I did. Anyway, so we've gone to this meeting at Langham's and then one thing turned out, we ended up in the Atlantic Bar. I didn't know he had part of the Atlantic Bar at the time, he owned part of it and he owned most of the doors in London and ministry and stuff. I didn't know any of this. I didn't really give a shit. And I remember saying to him, um, 
oh, I hate fellas that pull all their money out of their pocket, like rubber gangsters, and, and he, just as he was going to pay for a drink, like pulling all the money out, and I remember just slipping it in it. <laughs> and, but he had guys on different tables plotted up round it. He was heavy at the time, you know, and it was like, but he wasn't. He owned a good company, you know what I mean? But in, my, in a persona. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I said, well, I'm not coming out with you tonight. I've had these clothes on all day. He's like, where do you shop? And me being the little sly little addict, I went, <laughs> New Bond Street. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did I shit? I dropped, dropped in Primark, Zara, <laughs> a push. And he went, there you go. Just give me like seven grand to go shopping with. And I was like, I love you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And Because he, he wanted to impress me and at the same time. And we just hit it off. And I just told him exactly where how it was. To the, you know, we were mm -hmm. ride or die. He was my ride or die. And I was his ride or die. We just grew up and grew out you? of it. Did he understand He got me, you? man. He got me. Yeah. And he's and deep. And he, and he taught my kids. For the protection for somebody who uh, he was heavily he, 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 he had a lot of people work for him that collected money and stuff and I was well heavily protected at all times and I think when you come from a place where you've got people still on you uh, from your past nothing to do with drugs to do with that circle and you've got a young child mm -hmm. and you're fearful and you just want to kill yourself it's like to have someone that's got a lot of people that work for him a protection I was safe and he made me feel safe and he said to me listen I know you're not in love with me but I love you. And I was straight with him. I said, listen, I'll be honest with you. I'm not in love with you. I fancy you. I fancy you a lot. I do. And we were together and everything. I said, but I love you, but I'm not in love with you. And he said, but you will become in love with me. And he kept going on about me to marry him, marry him. And I said, listen, I'll be honest with you. I'll marry you to give my son a better life. And that's exactly what I did. And he accepted that. And I fell in love with him. And then I, and I fell in love with him. I did. As, I, as, as, as time went on and things happened, I fell in love with the guy. I did. And then as we got older and, and the kids grew up, we fell out of love. That's life. That's the way things happen. And, you know, and everyone thought I'd run off with all his money and da, 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 and I'd have affairs and we didn't. And we were solid, but we just grew up and fell out of love. So that life, he was giving you the protection, the security. He gave me that Did you believe, life. though, you weren't good enough? Did you have the insecurities, the jealousy, the not, to, why does somebody no. love me? Did you doubt yourself? No, because I still thought, even though I was an absolute walking about ravaged mess, that I was the bollocks, <laughs> but I wasn't. But, you know, and, and he loved me and he nurtured me and, and I was lucky for that. But we both just ended up with a lot of stress and pressure along the way, falling out of love. And that man's never, ever called me a C-U-N-T. He's never raised a hand to me. He's been nothing but good to me. And even in, we've, been, we've been our split. It was an amicable split. It was cool. I didn't take a penny off him at all because I came in with two carrier bags and my kid and I said if ever I leave you I'll walk away with nothing it's exactly what I did mm -hmm. and he's on good terms now we haven't spoken but we're, you know so as and when my daughter gets married she's with her fella and one day they'll get married and there's no need that we don't have to freaking fight and argue no I'm happy whoever his partner and everything and I'm, I just want him to be happy the same as he does for me yeah, and you just got divorced two weeks ago yeah after being separated since 2015 or whatever why so long just weren't important I don't want to get married I don't know what he's doing with his life so I know who he's, he's, he's got a partner and he's with someone um, and I'm happy for him but obviously that never really come up good but at least you've got a beautiful daughter out of it so yeah and she's cool and yeah. he's a great dad I've got, you know, my, and he took my son on board and my son you know my son's obviously got his dad no one will ever be his dad but his dad but Kevin was a stepfather to him was great to him and I've got a gorgeous stepdaughter as well you know and we had a, a lot of good times and family times and Wow, the man showed me the world. You know, we did, we had a great life together. And I said, I held him up when he had a lot of stress yeah. within business. and So a lot of good memories from it. All good memories, that's really. that's the beautiful thing about life. It's no matter how much fame or money or that is an illusion. That is all bullshit. It's about the memories. Yeah. The memories is what you remember. And he and paid for me to have a lot of treatment and a lot of therapy and a lot of other things. And he was, he's, Kevin's a very deep person and he understood me, how complex I was. And he helped me understand that. And he educated me about a lot. How many... Rehabs have you been in? Oh, quite out loud. Now you're asking me. I think about nine. Some places, are, <laughs> some places twice when they'd have you back. <laughs> so after these things, the first three years, what happened? Does he get sacked because of the drugs? When? Like recently? The first time. The very first time. Oh, fucking hell. Um, no, I just left. I left to, I left and joined ITB. Why did you leave? I left to work with Timothy Spore and Frank Stubbs Promotes for two years. And I went to ITB before they started the Golden Handshake deals, obviously. Um, and then I went from there, I flew back, I went back to EastEnders. And then by the time I went back to EastEnders, I was really freaking ill. How hard was it to watch somebody else play your part? I was happy for that. I just got into recovery. Um, I got recovery in the March, had my daughter in the September, won my son back from custody 
from the High Court in November, um, two days before his Easter birthday. Um, and I got moved house in the December and I got married on the 27th of December here around the corner in Chelsea Harbour. We hired the Conrad Hotel and have got married there. And they they called in the end of January and they were like, well, listen, we're bringing Sam back. Uh, but obviously you've had a lot of trouble and blah, 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 blah. And obviously with my nose and my face and everything. How do you feel about that? I think it was John York. I'm not sure. John York's great. He, was one of my, he used to be a prop boy when I first started. He's one of the bosses and that now. John's cool. He said, listen, Daniel, I want to ask you to talk to you about it myself. And we were off thinking about recasting. I said, well, I'll be happy for you to recast her. I said, because I can't put anything in front of my recovery. I've got a, a daughter that's like nearly six months old. And I've only just, this is the longest clean I've been since I was 13. I was like, I can't do it, John. And he's like, I'm really glad you said that because we really would like to recast for the minute for your own safety. Your safety obviously is paramount. I know it hasn't looked that way over the years, but we were all new to the media and addiction. Because life changed at quite a pace back then. And the BBC is the BBC, you know, and they protected me as much as they could, but they didn't understand a kid like me and the way media moved fast. I don't know how much attention Sid and I got publicly. New to them as well. Um, and I said, yeah, whoever it is, I wish them all the best and and thank you very much. So many times have you been back to EastEnders? And then I went four? back I went back after 10 years of being out of the show, I came back. How was that? Oh, I absolutely loved it. Did you? Yeah, I was only meant to be there a couple of months, ended up staying for nearly six and doing Dance on Ice alongside it. But I had already, we'd already planned, we had a home in California, Southern California, and the kids moved over before because I was still working. So I wasn't going to stay full time. Um, and I finished Dancing on Ice, literally did the final. The week before the final, I had to be there for the final and the final finished and two days later I flew back to Cali. Do you think you ever go back to EastEnders? I went back after that as well. I've been back twice since. <laughs> you've been on um, EastEnders more times, you've been in rehab. <laughs> I have. Um, yeah, I think I will. They're talking about, uh, someone's talking to me at the minute about a return, but I don't know how, how true or false it is. Um, it's my 30 year anniversary since the day I joined the show. Um, yeah, I'm a different person today, a very different person. And I think, and also think the show is missing um, people to play matriotic. Like when I joined, there was Pauline. Pat, you know, people, a lot of them older, Peggy, all them older characters. See, Sharon's only got so many people to play against. Like Sharon and Kathy, although they're related because of Ian and da, da, da. So, yeah, I think, and her and Sam have a lot of, a lot of history. Sam hates Sharon. The Metro family's the biggest stars. family in East End, does it? It was. What, what's Slater's why? quite big. Yeah, yeah. The Brannings are quite big. And I've got, a, and I've got a baby with, with Jack. He's like the best looking thing in it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. That's a, do you, when you think about it being 30 years ago, does that, do you go, fuck me, where did it go? Oh, fuck, I feel 104. I am 104, but like, <laughs> in my head sometimes I feel like I'm 18, but I'm not. But what? yeah, no, I, I do. Do I want to go back to EastEnders? Yeah, but it had to be right for me. Have to be the right thing for me, because obviously I've walked away from everything starting again. Were you using every time you were on EastEnders? No, no, I wasn't actually. You'd been actually. clean before? Yeah, I was clean. When I went back after 10 years, I was clean and sober for the whole thing. Just because... It's like maybe you get the old fame and attention again and that's an excuse to start no, it wasn't, using it wasn't to block out the pain. No, it wasn't or... any of that. I relapsed. When I last relapsed, it was because of a marriage breakdown and because of a few different things in my own weakness. What was America like? I loved California. I had my own dog groomers. I went over there and... Uh, what was actually, it called? Sharon Barking and Palace. I seen one called Doggy Style, which is Literally, funny. Yeah, cool. like, mine funny. was Barking and Palace and it was all done. Like, and I had to doggy daycare and stuff. But I learned to groom dogs. I love animals. I love the outdoors. I'm quite. A, I like. I'm, I'm yeah, really love nature. Yeah. Yeah. I like the horses. I like. I love nothing better than having a small holding. So for me, and plus part of me family being travellers, I've bought, bought up around horses now a lot of my life and dogs. But yeah, um, and that's my thing. I'd be quite happy with like a double lodge in the middle of nowhere. You know I mean? So with right now you're in. feeling good. You've got plans for the future. Yeah, I mean I've got a few things to do. My son and I are thinking about writing a book um, about my relapse basically, as therapeutically, because um, uh, from where he is, because obviously he had me for 14 years clean, and then he was a young adult when I relapsed, and uh, I was going to do a chapter about my relapse, how the build-up to it, how it happened, and the fallout, and the book was going to be about that, and then going back into recovery, and then as I do a chapter, half a chapter I'll do, the other half he'll do from his point of view, as a child of that addict, 
mm-hmm. and how it felt and the anger and the anguish and how the things and you know, how he saw me when I was using and what my states were my psychosis states and everything and how I saw it because I thought the world was against me and that I was lashing out and smashing things up and doing it because they were violent towards me and stuff it wasn't it was because where my addiction had escalated so far if you like but so we were going to do a book like that together and I think it would help a lot of people and give the proceeds obviously to a charity for children of addicts and stuff yeah definitely people need to get a better understanding of addiction and trauma and pain and the world's in turmoil just now. It is. It's, um, it's COVID thing is really messed a lot of people. Struggling and if the COVID has well happened in the winter time, I think it'd have been even worse. The dark nights, the winter yeah, really stuff hard. like that. Do I believe in it? I still don't know. You need to, again. I don't know what I believe, but I know it, I know it's brought mental health to a head yeah. massively in this country. Mm-hmm. Couple that with the recent exam results and that for kids. I mean, I'm surprised the suicide rate hasn't yeah. been through the roof. Thank also God it what? hasn't been. Two hundred fifty percent um, rise in suicide since the Corona virus. There's a lot of pressure on kids now with social media, with huge, trying to compare huge. everybody. Everybody's got filters on their photos and you've got the best looking girls using filters. Why? My little girl does a blog actually on hers and uh, and she speaks for it and she's got a good following. She's a good looking kid. I know everyone says that about the kids. She is. And uh, she has got like a dream last off. A fella's a Formula 2 driver and they've been together since I was at school. The kid's been for a lot. She didn't see me for five years because of my own illness. She lived with her dad. Um, How did that affect you? Terribly, I used even more. Just wanted to kill myself, hated myself even more. Until my son was like, listen, you've got two kids here and I'm sitting here holding you up. I'm a kid and all. You know, so it's hard. But, you know, in a tragic style, I wasn't going to get ready until I was ready. There's been times I'm still not ready. Um, but at the same time, it's like for me, I look at my daughter and she'd done a thing the other day and I'm proud of her. I was like, wow. And she come on there and she just said, listen, I used to sit here and cry. So my mum and my nan and that, and why don't I look like that person? And I've got stretch marks and I've got this. And, I've got... and she just sat there and she just showed her stretch marks on her belly and she went, I'm, I'm just me. And it's okay to just be you. And you don't have to look like these people stunting in life. And da, da, da. she talks massively about it. She does a lot. She works for a big PR company in town. And um, she said, you know, I work in promotion and PR and it's all about selling a brand. And actually working in that industry has helped me realise that I'm selling a brand. And um, that we're just a person. We don't have to sell ourselves for an insta life. It's not going to change our life. It's not going to make us any happier. And she said on there, actually, she said at the times, my mum was clean and sober and the most money she's ever had in her life, security, three million pound house, fucking private plane to, to go anywhere in the world with my ex-husband, did anything I wanted. I used to go, I like that car. Three days later, I'd have one. You know, six cars to choose from on the drive and stuff. She went, and I used to watch my mum cry herself to sleep at night because she just couldn't understand why she was unhappy. She said, because it was mental health. Yeah. She said what she got from lots of different things that happened. And she just speaks openly on her blog and says, you know, we all have issues and it's mm-hmm. okay, but we need to speak. Yeah, fair play. And like I say, private planes and money, big houses, it don't mean shit if you ain't happy Do you know what my him. kids say as well? My mom, kids go, do you know what, mum? And when you split up with dad and you did your stubborn shit and end up in a hostel and everything, she went and you was running an extension lead under the door to nick the electric out of the hallway... And we were sharing pot noodles and shit because we had nothing because I was a raging freaking cokehead, selfish as it is. She said, we used to lay in bed, the three of us, freezing with our dog. She said, burping, the, she said, I used to burp the alphabet and make Kyla. laugh. <laughs> and it was them things they remember. She said, but you go through all the times when we've had fucking 10 grand birthday parties and stuff. She went, I can't remember half of them things. Mm-hmm. She said, but we laughed. You know what I mean? And when Kevin started his business up again and he's driving a freaking van and taking the call and all that after hitting his on his ass as well, Mike's husband, she went off and sat there with dad next to him. And he, That's what my kids remember. And it's how you come out of it the other side, which makes you who you are. A million percent. And we're always going to hit obstacles. You're going to hit many more. It's just, oh God, this yeah. is life. But you see, when I'm better mindset, we can handle them a bit better. My, do you know what? Meditation helps me a lot. How and, many and times do you meditate? As many times I bloody need to. <laughs> but I definitely, it's the first thing I do when I wake up. And I would never go to bed without listening to a meditation, mm-hmm. ever. Um, I'm really into my Reiki. I'm into my, my I'm into my spiritual with yeah, paganism. I had Reiki yeah, today, amazing woman into from Scotland, born the McLean. Amazing woman. I did my Reiki course with her. It's all about energies and my vibes. good friend Jodie, Scotch girl. Yeah. Who my Jodie's named after. She uh, she does all my Reiki for me, and mm-hmm. she she introduced me actually to a guy from Peru. It was a spiritual guru guy that released entities from me. I've had all that stuff done. I thought it could be anything, but just not addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I like the Reiki. I do a lot of yoga. I'm looking, Kai's actually looking to come with me. 
Jodie's not feeling the love for it, really, to go for a month to India to a detoxing yoga camp and a Reiki camp. Kai said he'll come with me. It's, yeah, it's a beautiful it's a thing, thing to, to be do. searching for something naturally. Energies, frequencies, love energies. vibes, instead of the external stuff. This is Music. all working within and... Listen, you change the way you think, you can change the way you feel, you ch- change the way you look at the world. Speeding Thanks. myself. Yeah, everything is different. And I always say it, but the brain only repeats what it knows. So, But you can change that, yeah. you can change the neural pathways, you can change... Hugely. All the fucking... It takes 28 negative. days yeah, to, break to form a habit, habit mm-hmm. to form it and to break it. Mm-hmm. You do something for 28 days every day, it becomes a habit. Consistently, though. Consistently. And it, what happens is Structure. neurons in the brain which fire together, wire together. Go. So if you do something consistently, it creates that, and the subconscious mind will flip that. And see but, all the cravings and all that stuff, other than people that do have to have a rattle and stuff, I get that. But see me, like I said, I walked into Big Brother House doing 11 bags a day. My head was shot. But the minute I woke up the next morning, all I've known from a child is work. And I woke up the next morning, it's what sets me apart from that being real reality TV people I've worked this industry since seven years old I know it inside out upside down you know I know when to pull a stunt with the press I know when they're having a slow news week to throw a set of pictures out I know how to sell pictures I know what to do with this industry and I make no bones about it it's how I've made my money so I've fed myself you know and I look at it and I walked into that house and the minute I open my eyes in the morning that first 30 seconds we sometimes you go and I thought yeah I'm at work go to work and there were days I was clucking I ain't gonna lie I was days when I thought fuck I could die for a bit. Or this, that, and the other. And, and I'm at work. Work's always coming first. Mask comes on, you know how to play the act. Yeah. And just... But now today, I know how to reach out for help. And luckily yeah. for me, Darren Day was in the house and Johnny Partridge, both of them have been in a lot of recovery. And I used to just talk to them. And Darren Day's one of my best mates in the world. And, um, you know, I can speak to Daz about anything. I'm very lucky today. I've got people within this industry that have walked the path I've walked. If they'd been knocked down by the press and that because of their own stupid mistakes as well. And um, they get me and don't judge me for shit. Yeah, because you got to the final on Big Brother. Did you start using as soon as you get out? Yeah, same night. Yeah. Same night. Walked straight out of there and all the load of gear. My son just looked at me and went, what the fuck are you doing? I was like, I didn't know. I had no zero remorse or respect or it's where I was at. Yeah. I didn't know I was spiritually. And another thing... I'd not been on my own since I was 15 years of age. I've always been in a relationship. And the last 18 months, two years, I've not been. And do you know what? It's been like, it's been a breath of fresh air for that's me. Where you I find needed yourself. to sit on my own. Yeah, that's where you find yourself because too many different people around you, too many different energies. You, you try and adapt to everybody else and say they're sitting in your own comfort, sitting with your own thoughts. And it's a dangerous place to be as well. It is. And you know what? I put myself in the last year in some shitty whole situations, man, that I shouldn't be in and... I sit there and I think, what the fuck are you doing, Westbrook? Sometimes I've got a thing and someone sent me a quote out of nowhere. Someone off Twitter just sent me something. and I don't know who the fuck it was. Sent me this and went, I thought you might need this today. And then left my page. And it just said, it had a picture of a lion and breathing, like roaring. And it just said, take a deep breath and remember who the fuck you are. And I've got it. And within two days, I packed my bags, moved from Liverpool back to London. In a mad sense. And then I went back to Liverpool again. But even so, I needed sometimes reality checks for stuff. I like, I don't know, for me, certain things come up, flag up at one time or another. It's a spiritual hookup sometimes for yeah. me. We need to touch on uh, self-harming. When was the self-harm. first time you self-harmed? Oh, God. I first self-harmed as a child after I'd been abused. How old? Uh, I think about 12, 11. 11. A lot of people I went to school with used to eat soap and stuff to keep their weight down. Anorexic. I just love food. I'm never going to keep my... <laughs> I, you know, I, I went about that. And then people were in pain with different things. And then one girl said to me, well, I just... I burn myself. I thought, what do you mean you burn yourself? So I just burn myself. It's hot and it bubbles. And I remember sitting there thinking about it, thinking about it. And I was at home one day and my mum was in hospital with cancer. And I had so much shit going on in my head. I can't remember the exact things of it. So, uh, uh, not correct, 100%. But I remember sitting there in the bathroom. I was just thinking, fuck it. And I got my dad's lighter. My dad's had a big old fat Zippo lighter. I know it could have been a worse thing I could burn myself with. It wasn't like a clipper. It was a big fat. And I was just holding it there. And holding it there. And it was on my leg. It wasn't over my arm. It was on my leg here. And I got a scar for it. You know, and that was that. And I thought, fuck it, what did you do that for? You know what I mean? And then I remember it bubbling up and going yellow and everything. I panicked about it. And then about three days later, I'd say to my dad, because my mum was in hospital, 
Dad, I burnt my leg with a kettle. Da, 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 da. Climbing up to get sent by the kettle boy and it's burnt on my leg. And he was looked at it, he was like, what the fuck is that? Took me straight to the hospital. I remember seeing the shock in him. He was like, why didn't you tell me? It's looked like it gone septic and stuff. Didn't do it again for many years. And then when I was with Brian, and I was in a lot of pain, the height of my addiction uh, back then, the first time. Um, and he was away all the time, Australia, touring, uh, weeks at a time. I used to just burn myself, burn myself, burn myself all the time. And I've burnt, I've burnt lumps out of my face. I've cut my, I've cut my face here. I've picked cups here. I've cut all over my face. I've got, I've got scars all over me from self harm. But like, especially on my arms, which I never used to do my arms. And in the last eighteen months, I've done a lot. Still to this day. Yeah. Not so much to this day. I don't do it now. This week, I've done it. Well, I've done it today. I've done it for. Probably about four months. That shows that you're getting stronger then. Yeah, I lost my dad in March. My dad's dementia and stuff and a Sorry lot of things. I hate crying, I look so ugly. When I cry, I go to me, why are you crying? You look so ugly. But yeah, I still do it. Sometimes I don't realise I'm doing it, I just do it. So when you get a bit of trauma, a bit of pain, you, you go and self-harm to try yeah, and make I yourself do. feel better? But I don't always know I'm doing it. I'll be upset and I'll just do it. Yeah, sorry if you're lost because I know your old boys get dementia as well. We've been speaking quite a lot the last few weeks. And yeah, we have, yeah. Listen, you're going through a lot of shit again in your life. Yeah, but it's all right. It's not, it's not, um, it's, it's life shit. It's not self-inflicted shit. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. adult shit. But you get to that just, age yeah. when people start dying. It's just natural. And but at like, least you're staying on the path. At least I'm you're staying there, on man, the I'm path. I'm getting there. I'm a, I reach out today. There's people I can speak to. And there's always been people I can speak to. I just didn't want to reach out. I just wanted yeah. to use <laughs> When was the first time you went to rehab? I first went to rehab in, to do with Elton John actually put me through. Got in touch with someone and uh, they put me in the chart of Nightingale when I was, fuck, after I first left EastEnders. The first time after ITV, I went back to EastEnders the second time and then I came away to do, when well, they put me in rehab for a little while. What was that like? Oh, I, don't, I was just in a, a horrible little shit. <laughs> I didn't want to talk to my my counselor was Scottish actually. He was a great guy, and um, yeah, he was a good guy. And I threw tantrums. I wanted to be thrown out. I tried to run away. All of that shit. Do you know what I mean? I just didn't. I just didn't want to be there. I thought it was better than everyone else. But so, you're only young. You're only young. Yeah, you think and I was you know on the telly, and I thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I used to look at everyone and go, "Oh my god, these people are drug addicts." Yeah. It was so are you love, but I didn't see it like that. Mm-hmm. Um. I just didn't want to be there. I wanted to be out partying. When did it really start to take its toll when people could, started noticing, okay, she's in a oh, bad place? I was place. with Brian and I was locking myself in the house and self-harming and doing like probably just over an ounce and half a week to myself indoors. Get like paying the freaking milkman through the letterbox and shit, taping up windows and... You're getting paranoid? Paranoid. I was like six and a half stone when they put me in the rehab that time. When did the nasal septum, when did that start going... That went on right before I got married. The last, like, that massive time when um, no one would fly me to Arizona. I was with Cheryl Barrymore, was my agent, and Michael's wife. She tried everything to get me everywhere, her and Kevin. My husband, I was three months pregnant with my daughter, and that time I was banging all sorts of I was like doing coke, doing crack, doing all sorts of stuff. Um, and I was bad. And then they said to me, and I started having fits all the time. And my son was three and a half, no, I was Kai. I mean, was, no, I didn't get back to his three. It was under three. And he, I remember him trying to, used to always try and put Mars bars in my mouth. And he used to scream and scream and scream so somebody in my block would ring, like try and get in and ring ambulances and stuff. And I had overdosed in Cheryl Barrymore's house in Stanhope Mews around the corner. Um, and he ran up to some Cheryl, my mum is blue. And I was down in her basement in her apartment down there. And she, he went to, into her, in the other part of the house and said, my mum's blue. And he was nearly three years old. Um, when they called me an ambulance and stuff, she was wary about calling me a private ambulance, obviously, because it was me. Um, and I was pregnant with Jodie. I was three months pregnant with Jodie. And I was freaking ill. And then all my organs were giving up. And they said to me, I had about six weeks to live. I didn't give a shit. I did not give a shit. And um, she was like, no, oh, something's got to give you. So she got on to Beachy, my counsellor, and other people, and, and Dr Brenner, who was, was the head physician at the Priory at the time, and like the Priory were like, listen, we've had her here five times, we really can't help her. It's out of our control. It really is. So they were right, the last thing is Cottonwood. Went to Arizona, I've been to Betty Ford. Um, I went to Arizona, and I was going to her, but I don't need to go to treatment. I need to go to Champneys. 
still completely gone in the head. I thought, hell, fine, would do it for me. And um, she went, no, you need to go, and not one airline would fly me. Every time she went to book, they were like, no, we won't fly her. She was all over the press that I'd overdosed. And I'd been on a show called The Priory, funny enough, and I was absolutely fucked up my head on it. And she showed it back to me. She was like, this is what you look like. And I was about six stone wet, pregnant, three months pregnant as well. And, uh, you know, I sent my mum near enough for a breakdown and, and stuff. And I said, all right, I'll go. And the only person that would fly me was Richard Branson, Virgin. It's the only people, thank God for him, because he, and they flew me there. But even on that flight, Kevin got the guy that used to be look after us, security, Luke, big guy, to take me. And fucking me, they ended up shackling me to the streets, to the seat halfway to LA. Because I was in first class, I was abusing him on the phone with the credit card machine, I bought everything from duty free, and I went in the toilet and had a cigarette, everyone's laying in their beds to sleep in first, paid a fortune. And the stewardess is knocking on there, Miss Westbrook, are you smoking in there? And I opened the door, I have a cigarette, I went, yeah, what are you going to do, open the door and fucking throw me out the plane? You're not. I was horrible. Why did no deal slay you? Because they, they knew I only had six weeks to live. It had been all over the papers. Morgans were shutting down. They didn't want to fly me without a shoe. No, I'm going to go over and die on their plane, on their airline. And uh, they had to cut the, the captain radio through to control and they were going to get me to LAX, turn me around and send me back and extradite me from the States. And it, and it got up to their head off at the Virgin and they said, no, don't do that to her. Give her the benefit of the doubt if you have to shackle her. And, and then asked Luke to give me Valiums and everything else that he had with him. Mm-hmm just to let me sleep it till I get to LA. Then that's what they did, and thank God they did. It's difficult as well. If you've got addiction problems, I was it's wild. hard to take, never mind being splattered all over the press. How do you oh, think... Oh, yeah, but I use that to my advantage all the time. Do you still get money from it? Yeah, I used it to my advantage. Mm-hmm. You know, I, 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 um, I got money for it right up until... Well, not so much when I was married, because I was married. I didn't need the money. Kevin had a lot of money, so... And when we did our wedding with OK magazine, all that, we gave all of that to a drug charity. We were sober then. Um, but even up until the last time I went in treatment, I was doing pat pictures, churning out pat pictures freaking daily with absolutely zero self-respect just to pay for my habit. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was only thanks to Jeremy intervening on Jeremy Cole's show that, that, that got me there, because Jez is my mate, and went, this and this ain't happening no more. And bang, I was in rehab within three days. Was there ever a time you went to rehab and thought, right, I said, I'm going to really give it a try here to change my life? Arizona, yeah. And the last time I went... Just recently, other than that, I'll be honest with you, no. Not once, I went for everybody else. Yeah. The 14 years were off, how were you feeling? Um, I was all right. I was, I was happy to be clean, so I didn't crave it once at all. But I had everything around me I needed, and I was happy, and I had a brand new baby, and I was, you know, life was great, and anything I wanted, I had my own parking spot, of selfridges, and things that were so important to my materialistic little life, I had. Um... But I still felt empty. I felt soulless and I couldn't understand it and I didn't realise I had mental health. You understand that a bit more now? I've really researched it. Yeah. And my son's a great advocate for researching freaking everything. So, you know, and I've, I've done a lot of work and obviously finding this counsellor, Michelle, at PCP that I found. Um, she's funny now enough at the Priory. I work with her and, and she just opened so many doors for me with mental health and explained, you know, I, have, um, I take medication for bipolar for, um, oh yeah, that curtain. I've had medication for bipolar. I've got schizophrenia, borderline schizophrenia, but, um, borderline personality disorder. So many different things. So many different labels. So many different strands, yeah. When I, when they diagnosed me with that first of all in America, I was like, oh, it's American jargon. They love to box everything off. You know, everyone's on tablets in the States. Mm-hmm. You know, Valiums and everything else and Xanax and... But no man, I needed I needed medication. Yeah. You've had that heartbreaking story as well, heartbreaking life, tough upbringing, but you're so also successful and everything you've been through, you're still here fighting. And I always say, if you've got air in your lungs, you've got something to give. Now you're going to help a lot of people through addiction, who's been abused. Yeah. And now you're standing here fighting, you're standing here telling your short story. That shows strength, that shows guts, it shows courage. You're clearly a fighter. You don't want to give up or else you wouldn't fucking be here. Listen, you can't you know keep I mean? something as well if you don't give something away. Yeah. You know, and that's why mm-hmm. I think I didn't keep my recovery the first time around. I didn't give anything away. I kept it all for me. And do you it think the real. time is now though? Just to- the time is now. Do you know what? I don't know what I'm going to do or where I'm going to go. And I've got lots of different things that come in my path. Um, 
but something's going to happen and I can feel it and I know it's brewing and it, I feel stronger and I feel strong enough to do it. I want to go back to work. I'd like to go back to EastEnders even if it's only for three months just to just to round something off for me. I'd like to go back full time for a few years really and take over the Vic. Do you feel as if <laughs> you're like, a risk though? Um, I think I was a risk. Now I'm not a risk. And I have no baggage either now in the way of like... Um, Fellas and boyfriends and husbands, and <laughs> I'm just me and the dog. Were you a sex addict? Was I? Yeah. Do you know what? No, I wasn't because I used to put sex, as I said, I felt nothing mm-hmm. with sex for years, but I used sex as a manipulation tool, and I still did right up until I last went to recovery. Yeah. Be honest with you, I did. I used to get off on it. If Do I'm you honest. feel this is then is a new chapter for you? You're divorced, you're clean, you're sober. Yeah, I'm happy. You're feeling good. You're not self-harming. You're speaking openly and honestly. Yeah, I'm what, using the tools yeah. that I've been given. And yeah. I'm using the God, what, God, what God's given me around. And I've learned today what's really important to me is feeding my soul. Mm. And I won't take a decision or an, an offer with work or even what I'm going to live. Mate, even what I'm doing that week sometimes, if someone's inviting me to do something, I'll say, I'll ring Kai and Kai. I go, Mum, man, you need to start making your own decisions here. So I'm like, but Kai, do you think that's good for me to go out and be around him? Like, I was meant to go to Bifa for the whole summer with a friend of mine who's, who does massage and all that and then do this freaking holy, not holy, but like a, a spiritual thing. And I went, listen, I know it ain't going to be spiritual for me. One trip to Ocean Beach, I'm going to be right there on the freaking LPR, mate, and I'm going to be partying <laughs> the whole summer. Can't wait to kind of, so I'm going on this spiritual type thing. He went, you're going to Ibiza for a season spiritually. He's like, I've heard it all now. He said, you might as well get a gun and stick it to your head because you're coming back in a box. He said, you're nearly 47. You haven't got that many goes around left in you. He said, for God's sake, he said, I'm starting to wear thin now. And he was right. And I went, you know what? When you put it like that, you're right, kid. He went, Mum, you know you're going to have a trip to Ocean Beach. You're not going to be able to help yourself. He said, you're going to be surrounded by people in your party lifestyle that are going to G you up. He said, and that'll be you done. So obviously, I think like, COVID happened anyway, thank God. Mm-hmm. But not thank God, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Does for Kai me, drink? Kai very rarely has a drink. Mm-hmm. He smokes. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, my daughter don't. My daughter like, can have a drink, but she don't take drugs. You see Ross Kemp saved your life as well? Ross and Stevie both helped me. How come? <sighs> Ross didn't, uh, on a seat, not save my life so much, but he, um, I passed out once at the top of the stairs in the Vic and hit the deck. Because I was just constantly, would have that thing with coke where I was doing that much and then I was gouged like that out with stuff where I needed to have a line. Well, I'd be up for days and I would gouge out really bad. Um, almost like heroin addict gouges out. I used to be like that bad with drugs. Um, so am I blocking the foot? It's blocking the shot. Mm-hmm. And I just went over, ping, gone, down. And I fell from top to bottom of the stairs on the Vic. And Ross just caught me like that. And he held me in his hands and they said, um, come over from the top board on the mic like that, press the button, pick her up and make her work. And Ross just looked and Stevie just, I just remember coming to him and seeing Steve Steve always worries me anyway. He can make me cry like that, Steve McFadden. He's got that, he's got that look about him. He's like a big brother. And he went, no, I won't. And he, I remember being in his arms like that. And Barbara's only little, like that, up into his armpit. And she looked up at the two of them like that. And they went, no, we're not doing it. She's ill. The kid's ill. She's fucking ill. He said, she needs an ambulance. Get her an ambulance. She's ill. She's overdosing. And they said, make her work. And he said, if we, I'll stand down. And then a couple of the crew and that went, we'll stand down. That cost back then it cost 250 grand a day to make his tenders. No one stands down. You work. They love me. That's a good thing though. It's a great thing. And that shows you your they got character. Me a doctor. Yeah, that they shows got me you. A doctor, you know? Yeah, that shows you your character that you're very well liked, you're very well respected. I was dying. Yeah. You know, as well, I was, I was overdosing on the... You're still in good contact with a lot of people I spoke from... to Ross, he got all stung by wasps and that the other day, really bad. <laughs> Sent him a little message, Ross is cool, but he's out there mm-hmm. doing stuff, I'm so proud of him. Mm-hmm. Um, I've spoke to Stevie for ages, actually. But um, I normally go and try to get to see him in pants. I was going to try and get to see him in pants last year, I didn't get around to it. But Stevie, I do Barbara, I spoke, I saw Bar just before the corona happened, I went around to see Bar. And I'm hoping now it's a bit clearer, I'll speak to Scott now, I'm back in town. I'm back down from Liverpool at the minute. Um, I love Liverpool. Yeah. I just love it. Um, best place in Liverpool. Liverpool is nuts. It's like no, I just love Scousers, mate. I just love them. Cases. All my mates out there, little Scousers yeah. that love your show. Yeah, they're nuts, man. Well, they, love you, yeah. they love you. They love you. I had them Liverpool. all on the phone saying yeah. to me, oh, you're doing his show, his yeah. boss. I fucking love Liverpool. They're all nuts. They all Every fucking love you. Every guest I've had on here, they're nuts. Everyone, Scousers. They're fucking all crazy. Did you know what they are? They're real. Yeah, they're, they're real, just they're real all fucking people. bonkers, but... And they'll do anything for you, yeah. you know that. 
I love them and yeah. I love living up there and I just never a bunch of more Rilla people and my pals there and yeah, it's very my little Scouse that. family yeah. how is it talking about all this that bring back a lot of emotion for you Does... yeah I've worked a lot on it with Michelle and my counsellor mm-hmm. and uh, don't get me wrong James I'm not going to lie I'm not a perfect girl I'm never going to be a perfect girl I'm always going to make mistakes I'm unhuman uh, but I do have a tendency to pick myself up dust myself off but uh, I have a conscience today that I didn't have before because I was carrying other people's and today I have my own. And um, without being rude, people say a lot of things about me, whatever. And, and do you know what? We're all judges of people, no matter who we are. We sit at home, we watch the footy, and I'm, I think I'm the manager of the team. Or I watch the boxing, and I think I'm the freaking... You know what I mean? I, I, I'll try getting there and do it, not. <laughs> but, you know, we're all judge people to a point. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. But today, you know, other people's opinion of me, I had to lose the ego, along with a lot of things, because the right. ego is what helped back my fear and, 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 and thinking about the past mm-hmm. and stuff. And today, the only people's opinion of me that counts is the people I love. It, the other people's opinion don't pay my bills. And, um, you know, I, and if I think I've hurt my kids or the people in my close, cars and legs or, or Ginny and that, or people that are very close to me, then that breaks my heart. Everyone else is like, yeah. I don't set out to intentionally upset people. But people are going to talk about me good or bad. Of or course you're not, but people need to understand what your story is and what your background is. If they want to, they yeah. will. And I think you're phenomenal. I think even sitting here, the show's I courage. You're quite phenomenal yeah, yourself, son. Don't yeah, worry about that. Stuff, <laughs> that. I'll edit this, don't worry. Come out and met me in your suit. <laughs> rescue me off the side of the road while I was all eating the eggs. Oh, yeah, after shave While I was eating my meal, just <laughs> creeded up to the eyeballs, swafted out of me. No, what you're doing is, is phenomenal. And for what you've came through and the success you've had as well, as much as we can touch on all the fucking pain and misery, you're still very oh, successful. Great, you know what? I've had a great you know life I mean? and worked people with some of the best take, people. Give anything to have half of the success you've had. Oh, I'm blessed with But this belief. is only the beginning. I and always I tell people. continue to be blessed, yeah. you know, yeah. And my journey's just going yeah, somewhere. Yeah, this is only starting and the best years of your life are ahead of you. They really now, are. Through all that stuff, that's the past. Me and you, baby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's it. Fuck you. Yeah. Um, that's all the past. Let's go on about the future. Let's go on about what's your plans for the future, tell me. As mad as it is, do you know what? I don't know. Take it day by day? No, at the minute I've got a few things coming my way and I just think, I'm not actually even, I'm not fast. I don't get excited about it. I'm excited about booking my trip to India and doing my Reiki course and doing my stuff, my detox. Mm. I'm excited about travelling with my kids and maybe doing this book. I don't worry about the contact with EastEnders. And if it's going to happen, it's going to be happening. Until I'm there on set doing it, it ain't happening for me. Mm. But I've got a lot of things... You know, people ask me to do different things. I just think there's a plan out there for me and it's coming towards it. Every time I get myself in a pickle worrying about it and planning it, it don't come off. But I know it's a a massive change in my psyche the last six months Mm -hmm. come around um, and I've woken up to it. And I'm not quite sure where I'm putting my roots down, what I'm doing or where I'm going, but I know it's going to be a huge change. This time next year, I'm going to be a very different person to what I am today. And I positively... Hugely. Good, I love that because... Hugely. I'm trusting, it seems the, as if, yeah. trusting the process yeah, at the minute. Like I say, you're very well liked. You've you've clearly your I success, don't know how. Your, <laughs> your success shows it. But again, when you've got oh. that vulnerability of being honest and open, and I know you went on as a in therapy, that's where you opened up, and it's kind of changed yeah. things. But that's a, a release for you. Bottling Huge. all that shut up and releasing it all. Get your book out. And I'm not ashamed of it. Yeah, I agree. No, yeah, I just own my shit. Be. I do own my shit. I've yeah, always owned my shit. You shouldn't be. You shouldn't be. And I think people watching this will understand a bit more. I know your story's been there for years, but you've never really went in and just had a normal conversation without things getting twisted, without things getting edited. Not five minutes, not ten minutes. It's just you. Yes, you are fucked up, but we all are. Ain't we all, babe? We all are. And I am a crazy crap. You know, and I think that's why my scouse pals love me because I'm a absolute crank. They're like, Westy, man, you're crank. But I am, and I'm like, do you know what? I've never felt the last year more accepted by a bunch of people than I have been. Yeah, with my friends there as well and um, they've just loved me mm-hmm. they've just picked me up and loved me and I've got a good mate of mine up there Amy and you know I love her to bits and, and she's just been a great friend to me yeah you know it's amazing and this is only the beginning and for you coming on today and listen as much as we're here to let you tell your story you're still bringing yourself on you're a big name to come on my show as well I'm, I was excited I'm so nervous yeah. to come on here man and so you should have been I know, I know. I big it's handsome Scott's been not I mean putting the pressure on and I can understand you that's because I slowed down but my you tongue, did because yeah. when you're on the phone sometimes I go I'm what did you say <laughs> text me sweetie <Smitty. laughs> yeah so it's amazing what shy. you've done <laughs> I get shy and embarrassed 
I do. You should have seen his own the fucking coke though. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you weren't sure then. <laughs> yeah, um, no, for coming on today, I, re- I really appreciate it. Thank and you I so genuinely much. are rooting for you and I wish you all the best for the future. And I can't see wait, wait to see what you're doing. I think you're going to do big things. I ho- hope to see you in the telly again. Too. Yeah, I'm you going too. there. I'm excited to watch your yeah, yeah, but Dee, Thank you for having me on. It's I been love an absolute you. pleasure. I love you, babe. Speak to you soon. Thank you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.